Like a lot of New Zealanders, Chris Ives wept when she saw television scenes of the Rwandan refugee crisis. But unlike most of us, she didn't just mourn. She got on a plane and did something about it. She's one of five New Zealand Red Cross nurses stationed for three months in the Goma refugee camp at the very heart of the crisis. Some of them are old hands at relief work, others are novices, but they soon found out that this mission would ask a lot more of them than caring for refugees. Janet McIntyre travelled with the nurses into Africa. They knew it wouldn't be easy, but the five Kiwi nurses didn't expect to be caught in a riot on their first day in Goma. <laughs> Circumstances in town centre, we recommend you return to base over. But it sounds like uh, somebody has been killed. Um, I don't know by whom, but um, that's the reason for the demonstration. They're parading the, the dead person's body around. The cross town trip becomes a race for safety, and as troops move in to quell the riots. <laughs> Shots are being fired in the middle of town. With gunfire just metres away, we make a run for the shelter of a nearby Red Cross compound. I'm okay. All right. Yep. How's that? How are you? I'm fine. Bit shaky, a bit jittery. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't got much adrenaline left, I don't think. It's kind of quite exciting, actually. Quite exhilarating, but scary at the same time. I'd like a cup of tea. <laughs> this was to have been the nurses' first day on duty in the camps, but here they are, stuck in the Red Cross compound. We can't cross town because there's so much tension in the streets and it's simply too dangerous for us to go out. So we'll have to sit it out here and hope things settle down. Have you assessed the airport road, eh? And so we play a waiting game. In this case, checkers. And I learn some new rules. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a long wait. The trip to the refugee camps called off till next morning. The Shigella agent is resistant to most antibiotics. The day starts with a quick briefing with doctors and nurses from a dozen different countries. Then it's off to the refugee camp. Kabumba is 30 kilometers away. 30 kilometers of dusty road lined all the way with refugees. 350,000 people live here in an area the size of Rangitoto. And like that island, it's barren volcanic rock. Cholera once claimed two lives a minute here, but now that disease has run its course. People here see the Red Cross as central to their survival. Kids cling on to our van asking for help. Scattered among the huts, one of five Red Cross dispensaries, treating meningitis, malaria, diarrhea, dysentery. This is an A&E waiting room from hell. People so sick, they are wrapped in what will be their death shrouds. Finally, the nurses are face to face with the casualties of Rwanda. One tiny patient becomes a personal challenge for Colleen Clark. This little girl, she's three years old. She was seen yesterday with neck stiffness and um, query meningitis and uh, given some treatment and sent away. She's come back this morning. She's um, extremely feverish. She's um, semi-conscious and has been fitting. And um, her prognosis is not very good. In a cold corner of the hospital, Barb rescues a child wrapped in a damp blanket. If, if they're warm, that's half, half the battle in getting them well. If they're cold, they first, their body, they, sh yeah, they shake and they shiver, and all the energy is taken into trying to get them first warm before they get them better, okay? But even a cold blanket is better than none. Some patients have to go without, and even worse, they are hungry. The patients in the hospital, they are fed. Here? Yeah. No, they aren't fit. Not fit? No, no, no food. There is nothing to eat. Nothing to eat except a mix of flour and water that passes for soup. These patients are severely dehydrated. They have terrible diarrhea. But no bedpans and no beds. Medical care at its crudest. Is this the one with meningitis? Well... Without yeah. specialist care, Colleen's little patient has shown no improvement. We give them the basic treatments and then um, and watch them. If they survive, they survive, and if they don't, they don't. We're in an emergency phase. We cannot keep everyone alive. We, we, we keep the people alive that we think we can keep alive. The rest die. Glenn Eyes has also found a challenge. 
At first, this woman seemed to have the symptoms of tetany, but she's actually suffering a calcium deficiency. We're trying milk, but say the, the calcium content is probably not that high in it. So we'll just do the best we can. Colleen eventually gets some Valium to treat the child with meningitis, but has trouble getting a drip into her arm. She's quite dehydrated. The veins are very flat and they're very tiny, and so it's very difficult to get a line in. How do you think she's going now? Well, we just hope that the, that the uh, treatment will work, but she's very, very sick. Back at camp at the end of the day, there's time to unwind, to catch up on those personal chores, and share the day's experience. We're here, it's positive, you know. For me, it's going to be fantastic. Yep. I mean, I'm quite prepared to get smashed right between the eyes, and it's going to come, and it's probably going to happen quite a few times. That's okay. But I've had a first day, and it's going to roll, and it's going to be okay. I really was surprised that there weren't more dead bodies, and I'm surprised. I thought the smell would be terrible, and that's what I was expecting, but even in the hospital, it wasn't that bad at all. Coming back in the van, there was a couple on the side of the road. I actually found that really hard to take because um, I was feeling from the refugees point of view that you know someone in their family has died and they don't even have the opportunity to bury them with dignity. Obviously you can sort of deal with the unreality of such a large group dying but it's those one little ones that they've lost a hell of a lot but they're still building something. That something is a thriving tent city with its own central business district. Kobumba's 350,000 new citizens have survived a civil war and a cholera epidemic. There are quite extraordinary examples of survival here. Even so, it's a fragile existence. The rainy season wasn't supposed to start for another couple of weeks, but today, suddenly, this downpour of rain and hail I sent people scurrying into the little shelter they have. Well, if this is the start of the rainy season, it's going to mean extra misery and a whole new set of medical problems. new disaster. Staff in the dispensary spend hours mopping up and the nurses prepare for a deluge of new patients. In these freezing cold wet conditions they'll add pneumonia to their list of miseries and there's a desperate shortage of everything. Gerard, many people have no clothes. I do not have any clothes to give them. Yes, Can you say, I'm very sorry, but I do not have any clothes to give them? Yes. You know, I just keep thinking, what if we weren't here at all? At least we are um, a presence and an expression of caring around the world. This little boy spent the night in a rain-soaked blanket, abandoned like so many others. I mean, how proud can we be? Yeah. And he's going to die, you know. I know he's going to die long term. He's got a bit of a fever today. I don't know why he's got a fever. But he, all I can do at this point in time is give him a bit of food and a bit of love. The irony is that here, at the heart of the relief operation, it's often the simple, basic things that are still missing. Diarrhea is rampant in this camp. What's needed is paper towels to clean up the mess and keep people clean. And on a larger scale, these dispensaries need generators to keep them going 24 hours a day. As it is, they close at 4 o'clock, the nurses go home, and all but a handful of these patients are kicked out. The threat of more rain forces staff to shift patients outside while they erect more permanent tents. This refugee family was split up during the exodus from Rwanda. The 22-year-old woman lost her husband and has malaria, severe diarrhea and dehydration. Oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, it, I just uh, want to pick them all up, bring them home. Do you think about your boys often? Yeah, I suppose I, I hold them in my heart, and I think of them as well and happy, and it balances the, the sense of loss I feel here with these kids. Colin and Sally are also learning about balancing the pluses and minuses. What sort of impact do you think you can make? We're trying to work with all we've got, and it isn't much, and it's just making the best of the situation. 
and Colleen has had something of a triumph with her meningitis patient. We didn't think that she would survive the night and to go back to the camp yesterday morning and seeing her sitting up eating and drinking was uh, really great. I'll keep that image with me when I see all the depressing things. Glenn is also focusing on the, the positive, latrines. using her mm -hmm. administrative skills to design and set up a new yeah. clinic. Washing next to the latrines, because yeah. you could use that wastewater for, uh, put, say, chlorine or some deodorizer, and then you can use that water. Bob is still looking for answers. <laughs> Where do you start? When are they going to get a chance to go back home, um, get some sort of life happening again? But I feel heaps for them. Um, and I'm just glad that I can be part of helping them try and put it back together. And Chris is making a difference in big and small ways, like slipping the odd biscuit to a really hungry child. I mean, I'm really loving it. I know it sounds bizarre, but I'm not sure I love the scene. If you look around, it sort of looks like hell, really, isn't it? It's like something out of the Middle Ages. But um, what I focus on is the individuals that I work with, and it's very satisfying work. Mm -hmm. I'm loving it.